So hopefully now you have a good idea about what an alkane is, what an alkene is, and how we separate different fractions by fractional distillation. What we're going to talk about today is a process known as cracking. Now if you remember from the previous video, when we put our crude oil into the fractional distillation column, we had some of the fractions right at the bottom which didn't turn into a gas at all. They were thick, gloopy liquids. So as a quick illustration, Right, I'm not an artist at all, but let's say that we start at 400 degrees Celsius down the bottom. The crude oil is going to be coming in. So the crude oil is coming in from here, from the furnace, and most of it will turn into a gas and rise up the column like that. However, some remains as a liquid because its boiling point is even above 400 degrees Celsius, and it's a thick, gloopy liquid as a result, and it's going to come out the bottom here. One example of that is paraffin, or paraffin wax. Let's spell that wrong. Paraffin wax. And there are various others as well. But the point is that some of these are useful. We can use them for tarmac on the road and things like that. However, sometimes the gases which have risen up the column, like so, are more useful because they're the sorts of things that we use as fuels. And so it would be a waste if we couldn't turn these thick liquids into something a bit more useful. And the method that we do that is known as cracking. Now bear in mind, any long chain hydrocarbon can undergo cracking. In reality, we only really do it to the ones that we don't need. But in an experiment, you could use any long chain hydrocarbon and you can crack it. So what is cracking? Cracking is a thermal decomposition. Thermal decomposition. And the decomposition just means breaking down and thermal means using heat. And so all we're doing here is we're breaking down something big into smaller pieces. And an easy example to see is decane. Now decane, as you can hear from the A-N-E ending, I'll spell it for you, decane that is an alkane because it has A-N-E at the end. So DEC means 10, don't need to know that, but C10 and then H. Remember the formula is 2N plus 2, so 2N is 20 plus 2 is 22. That is decane. And when we subject decane to a high temperature, in this case it's around about 500 degrees Celsius as long as we use a catalyst. Remember, neither of those things are actually part of the chemical reaction. These are conditions, so we write them above the arrow. And we will get decane broken down into smaller pieces. And there is no exact answer for this, but there is a general rule. What we get if we crack an alkane, we will get a smaller alkane, let's say in this example pentane, which is C5H, 2N plus 2, which is 12. And then think about it, how many carbons and hydrogens have we got left? Well, we had 10 and we've taken up 5, so we only have 5 of them left. And we had 22 hydrogens and we've taken up 12, so we only have 10 of them left. Okay, so the simplest thing that we could write would be pentane here. This is pentane. And we've also got a hydrocarbon with the formula CnH2n. And if you remember from the previous video, that is an alkene. But we've still got five carbons, so that's pentene. So the important thing to realize there is that if you crack an alkane, you'll produce a smaller alkane plus at least one alkene. The reason I say at least one is because we could have also produced C5H12, which is our pentane, and we could also produce smaller alkenes. For example, propene, which is C3H6, and then we still need another two carbons and another four hydrogens, so C2H4. Now you'll notice here that this is still pentane, so we have one alkane. This, however, is propene, and this is ethene. So you'll see there that I've produced two alkenes. And in theory, if I was breaking down a huge hydrocarbon, then that means that I could produce a smaller alkane 
and however many alkenes I wanted in order to balance the rest of the equation. So we can produce loads of different alkenes, but only one alkane really in each crack. So let me just give you another example to demonstrate what I mean. If I had the hydrocarbon octane, which is C8H18, and this was cracked, that would be a high temperature, it would probably be around about 450, slightly lower than decane, and a catalyst as well. In case you don't remember, a catalyst just speeds up a reaction um, and it also allows it to happen at a lower temperature. Now I could produce any alkane I wanted which was smaller than octane. In this case I'm going to say I produced propane, which is C3H8, and then I've still got five carbons left and 10 hydrogens left. I could produce pentene, which is C5H10. So that's the five carbons and 10 hydrogens, and this is all balanced. I could have also produced C2H4 plus C3H6, which is two separate alkenes. So that'd be either pentene or the collection of these. So you can see that there is not one correct equation for cracking. It can produce loads of different hydrocarbons and the general rule is that you'll produce one type of alkane which will be balanced by the rest being alkenes. And remember it is a thermal decomposition because you do have to heat these in order to break them down. Okay, so that's all well and good, but what about in an actual lab? How does this actually look? Well, on an industrial scale, uh, this happens in a massive steel building, if you like, which is known as a cracker. So at oil refineries, where you are producing useful products from oil, there will be a steel building, which is known as a cracker, where they do this reaction on various different hydrocarbons. We obviously can't replicate that in our school labs or, our, or wherever we're going to carry out this experiment, but we can actually carry out a more simple version. So going to attempt to draw the apparatus again and it's going to end horribly. We have a beaker and we fill that beaker with water like this. We also have a test tube and remember I said one of the examples is paraffin wax so that's what that's the example that we're going to use here. It's quite easy for us to obtain. You'll have here some ceramic wool so ceramic wool soaked in our paraffin wax. This is taking up a lot of space, but you get the idea. Soaked in the paraffin wax. And we also have some ceramic chippings in here, like this. And this just acts as a catalyst and it'll speed up the reaction, okay? So chippings or chips, not potato chips, obviously ceramic chips, and these are acting as a catalyst. And so we have this test tube closed like this, and we have a delivery tube running from the test tube into our beaker, like so. We put a valve here, which will just let the gas out in a controlled way. And we have an upside down test tube like that, which is above the valve. Now, like I said before, this is a horrendous drawing, but what we are gonna do is fill this test tube with water. So this test tube is actually full of water, okay, when it's upside down. And so the paraffin wax is obviously liquid here because we've got wool which is soaked in it. What we are going to do is we're gonna heat the test tube. So heat the test tube. And the idea is that if cracking occurs and we produce smaller molecules from the paraffin wax, as we saw previously, those smaller molecules are going to be small chain alkanes and alkenes. And at this temperature, these are gases, whereas paraffin wax is a liquid. And so if we can collect the gas in the test tube, then we can see that cracking has occurred. And so what happens is if this is successful, which it should be if you set it up like this, in the test tube, the level of water, oh, this is a disaster, there we go, the level of water has gone down, and we can see bubbles being given off through this valve. 
Those bubbles are the gaseous uh, hydrocarbons, so either the alkanes or the alkenes, which are a, as a result of paraffin wax being cracked. And so these gases will actually end up filling up the test tube until the test tube is full of gas and there's no water left in it. So the water level will go down as the test tube is actually filling up. So it's a bit of a weird concept, but when the test tube is full, we can say that the test tube is actually empty in terms of the gas. So we haven't got any gas in there, we haven't got any hydrocarbons in there. When the test tube is empty, as we can see in terms of water, then the test tube is actually full up with this gas, with the hydrocarbons. So more and more of this gas is given off, the level of water goes down and down and down and down and down until the test tube is now full of gas and has no water left in it. Okay, so I hope that's helped. Uh, excuse the bad drawing, of course. I've never been an artist. But I hope that has cleared up how cracking works. Um, obviously, we use it so we can produce more useful hydrocarbons, and we can see it in a lab by carrying out this experiment. Okay, so thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.